Okay, everyone. So, uh, a big welcome from me as well for the afternoon part of uh, the first day of the conference uh, and the second uh, keynote uh, of our workshop. I have the great, great grand honor to introduce uh, Eva Tardos, uh, who will talk to us today about the learning game. Uh, honestly, uh, if I could uh, perhaps start listing some of uh, uh, Eva's uh, accomplishments and awards, I don't uh, think this would, uh, uh, even if I mentioned your federal prize, I don't think uh, this would make much sense. Uh, more, or at any rate, more than to say that she needs to go further than that.
So there's a lot of money in this business, but not in a particular app is very cheap. So what that really means is that the millions of repeats that makes it valuable, and that gives us an opportunity to think of what's really happening here is uh, people are learning. So what's really happening is we repeat these games over and over again, and uh, maybe you know something as you start, maybe you don't. Uh, but the, but what the blue line says, the players can use data, and probably they do, and most cases they do do, I know they do, uh, use data from past performance to figure out what to do next. In principle, you could do other things, but because the individual interactions are so cheap and not consequential, this is an incredibly cheap way of actually getting information about what one should do, and definitely useful. So this suggests that these are really good um, set up for, for, uh, um, for thinking about learning as an outcome in game. And I guess the first line that I'm going to think of uh, values being additive, um, that may or may not be perfect, and certainly deviating from that one is an interesting open direction. I guess in the packet routing version, it says that your objective is the average delay of a packet. Not a bad objective. Um, the values of the add, Again, there might be issues there, and I come, can come back to this. So what I'm going to think about, what one can think about is what can we say about outcomes of the games, and in the beginning part, I want to be more historical, as Crystal suggested, part of the, the intro, I want to talk about um, you know, learning as a solution concept, and these are sort of the main two questions. What can we say about outcomes of games if players are learning, and um, I also, how long should they play to ensure decent welfare? So how fast can they adjust to situations? Um, so learning has a really old history, and I guess my favorite start of this history is Julia Robinson for a date that uh, uh, predates when I was born. Uh, and presumably when most of you were born. So she was thinking of a particular gameplay, fictitious play, and I think she's sort of the start of, she's a mathematician really, uh, or was a mathematician. Uh, she, her way of thinking about learning in games was actually not my way when learning is what's going on, but there's a form of pre-play. That is, she was hoping that if you run this particular learning algorithm, fictitious play is just best responding to the past, what you observed, to what particular way of uh, learning in games, then this is a learning, learning episode up front, or as, as it was called pre-play, we learned to lead to Nash equilibrium. That was her goal in life. Uh, that, of course, doesn't work, and we know it. I mean, other people knew this before us, but they know it because look, <laughs> this is a very simple learning algorithm. We know that finding Nash is PPAD complete, so this simplistic algorithm is not going to do the job. And indeed, it doesn't. And mostly, the answer is that positive examples are rare and far between. <coughs> and I guess one that uh, two that are very simplistic, zero sum game, two person zero sum games, and two by two generic games, and maybe a class that we all love and we have heard some in the morning about these congestion games. Uh, those are classes of games where this sort of behavior does lead to to Nash equilibrium, but mostly it does not. Um, if I go back to uh, how CS people started to get involved in learning in games, one of the very earliest paper is, that I know of is this Fisher, Rock and Working paper, uh, which actually was in the same spirit. That is, what Fisher, Rock and Working was doing is offering a particular <coughs> learning algorithm that is, in particular, what they were doing is every player look, looks around, and if he sees other player more successful with some other strategy, then you might want to copy their strategy. That was the learning algorithm. It wasn't learning in the classical learning sense. And wanted to know how fast it converges. And really, I guess you can view this in the spirit of going to how fast can you get to a Nash, so in the same spirit that uh, Robinson wanted to go to. And actually, my early paper, or not so early paper, is, is uh, Bobby Kleinberg and Georges, who I saw, oh, there he is. I show him so, uh, show up a minute ago. Uh, 
But at that point, and I'll tell you in a second why, I was already convinced that that's not the most interesting strategy, but this other one, thinking of learning as a particular way of playing the game, um, uh, our play very almost can be in that spirit. We're choosing a particular learning algorithm that is multiplicative update and claim that that actually will do better than an Asha equilibrium. This is an agenda I still fully believe in, and I maybe want to convince some of you that despite this paper not being 10 years old, that this is an agenda of, of that we're speaking up. What we're trying to uh, convince or, or show here, or we're actually showing in congestion games, is that learning can do better than Nash. Not only that it may or may not find the Nash, maybe this is the wrong question, that learners can outperform what the first case Nash equilibrium does. And it makes sense that it should. Learners are trying to do something good. Learning should give them an opportunity to coordinate or try to coordinate or work on or accidentally running into coordination. And so we are showing that uh, it can, learning can outperform uh, an Ash equilibrium. Again, in congestion games, which are one of the few examples where we see where things converge to Nash. So uh, I guess we just avoid the worst Nashes rather than any Nash at all. Uh, what I want to actually more think of is this version where learning is the, the ultimate thing and not um, not the not an end to find the Nash equilibrium. I guess in the learning version, this is what finding an Nash equilibrium would look like. They do something up front, that's the black part, and then they get to the blue part, the green part, and then they actually find the Nash, or at least got close to it. And Nash is something that satisfies these rules, and I guess these are versions for cost games, so the cost of any other action is cheaper than what you're doing. And indeed, then you can keep repeating this action and feel uh, good about it. And I guess what I want to, want to, what I usually have been advocating for the last many years, and Christos advocated a little bit this morning, is learning or no regret outcome without uh, this ability, that is without the green, green, sorry, without the green part of finding an Nash equilibrium, which looks like this. You play over time. I want it to have this no regret standard, that is your cost is cheaper, or average cost, than any single fixed strategy with hindsight, or what I really mean, plus a little bit of error. So this is the no regret standard, and I'm again hoping that given the audience who have been thinking of theoreticians and actually people who cared about game theory, this is a standard that uh, most or all or almost all of you hopefully are familiar with. It's very similar to Nash equilibrium. If I didn't have that the strategies A's are, the A's, A strategy vectors A's are indexed with time, but it would be a single strategy vector, then literally this would be the Nash condition. How it changed is I added the averaging over time, and how I'm, the condition slightly cheats is that despite that the, what people are doing is, is indexed with time, the, what you should be doing is a single action with hindsight. That is, X is not indexed with time, it's a single action. What's good about this is that this is doable. So if you normalize the cost to be zero, between zero and one, then the cost over t, t times step could be as high as t, but you can get the regret error down to, say, root t. Um, that is to grow, grow less fast, non-linearly non in t. And there are tons and tons of algorithms out there. Multiplicative weight is one of them that can achieve this. So this is a standard that's algorithmically doable. Um, and I guess the step one in proposing uh, learning as a, as a action in game is that the players could do one of these things and then uh, hopefully we can say positive things. Um, so there are two versions of this assumption out there and I'm going to want to spend a few minutes trying to get you, get you to appreciate or, or explain that I really like sharply differentiating between a version of this which says, this is what players should do. I have many good suggestions for them called multiplicative weights or how, how to follow the Puerto reader or whatever. There are many algorithms out there. I have suggestions they should choose from this list. And then there's the second version 
I don't actually have a really good suggestion for them or like, you know, they could do this, I don't know what they're doing. I want to think of this as a behavioral model. I want to say that I don't know what players do, but they appear to satisfy this condition. So this in particular can happen because they're playing these algorithms, or it can happen for many other reasons. So one thing these algorithms all do is they randomize. They randomly choose the next section. And if you, you know, ever thought about um, trying to achieve this no regret condition, you know that this randomization is absolutely necessary. It's usually sort of an easy first introduction to learning starts with saying that any deterministic algorithm can guarantee this property. On the other hand, these players, which is um, definitely the adduction case, and I think even on traffic routing, for various reasons don't appear to be randomizing. In the adduction, is, I think they're not randomizing because really there is no need. There's so much randomness in the data anyhow that you don't have to inject your own randomness, it's random enough. Uh, in the traffic routing, they worried about all kinds of oscillation and other problems, and that's why they're afraid of randomizing. And in fact, if you think about traffic routing, and if any of you actually really worked on this, uh, the theory community have been suggesting to the networking people that randomization should help, and they've been resisting this suggestion for various uh, systemic reasons. So it's not clear they're following this suggestion, but yet, if you look at data, they appear to satisfy the condition, maybe because there is enough randomness out there uh, from traffic coming and going or from an internet. So they satisfy the condition. And I want to actually distinguish and spend some minutes distinguishing the sort of, you know, suggesting this is a behavioral assumption, behavioral model is different than actually naming an algorithm. So in this spirit, our paper with Georges named the algorithm. So it was in the, you know, maybe the, as Georges might remember, or certainly I remember, we had the broader agenda. We wanted to have it for all no regret learnings. But what our paper does is uses the particular named no regret learning algorithm. Um, the first people who made the suggestion and who actually convinced me personally to start working on this, who made the suggestion that this is a behavioral model, is a paper of Bloom, Evander, and Liget uh, that appeared in Potsy in 2006. Um, and I don't know if I'm at liberty. Christos was good at telling all his papers that got rejected at various previous places. Uh, this paper has a history I feel particularly embarrassed about and tempted to actually tell you, uh, even though it's not my paper. These two were rejected from some places, and one of those places I was the chair of. So I really shouldn't have rejected it. And I didn't mean to. I was totally, I don't actually know if the authors know that I know this. Uh, I discovered some years later that, gee, how come they didn't submit it to this conference I was the chair of? So I looked it up and they did. And I was the chair, and I maybe of those papers that, you know, those papers that somehow there's not so much discussion on, uh, I didn't pay enough attention. So embarrassingly, I was part of rejecting this paper, which I really, really shouldn't have. It's an amazing paper, and once I started to hear Avram talk about it, it totally convinced me to work on this. And he actually, very clearly, this is, I think, the first paper that instead of suggesting an algorithm that gets people to converge to the right solution, he says it's a behavioral model. I don't know what Norget algorithms they use or if they use any that we know of. If they satisfy the Norget condition, the algorithm satisfies the Norget condition, which is that the error goes sublinearly in the time, then it will converge to the right outcome. It's a beautiful paper and definitely convinced me that, hey, this is really cool and I've been ever since uh, thinking about this. Um, then they have a follow-up paper that they get somehow more credit for that originally proposed studying price of energy under this notion of, of this no regret as a learning assumption. Uh, and they actually gave it a name, which I'm not so fond of. They called it the price of tall energy which I guess is more anarchic than the Nash equilibrium. Uh, I think most of us now skipping the toll in the word and call this also a price of energy, just for simplicity. 
Um, and then there is the beautiful paper of Tim that proposed the whole smoothness framework and, and, and proved to us that uh, there is a, a, a much so, I guess, certainly the first paper was also about graphics or about potential games. The second paper has a couple other examples, but what Tim paper does, it shows that there is a general framework here and everything else has a same price of energy band that this uh, price of energy bands via, his smooth, via the smoothness framework may automatically extend to learning outcomes. So I guess this is what uh, Christos summarized as a beautiful and insightful generalization, and it definitely is. Um, so that's a little bit of a history of how we got here, um, and maybe this emphasis that I like the, the no regret assumption instead of as a particular suggestion, and just so that maybe, I guess, places where easy to show you data, this is from Bing ad auctions, and it does show you data that uh, these are advertisers, uh, these are advertisers of keywords that um, they, that there's lots of bits on, advertisers that seems to have insane amount of money, so at least they have very high budgets. So they don't use the budget to control how much they're spending, they must use the budget as a, because Google, Microsoft made them enter a budget, <coughs> they are doing something very high, that's not what really matters. Uh, so these are people where the, uh, the values that they over, over time is, is a reasonable assumption because their budget is so high. Uh, these are also people, as the data will show, that this is seven days, and every click here that you see that, like that red guy up there, up there that is changing his bid uh, multiple times a day. So these are people who are paying attention to their bids. And I think one thing I would take away from this picture, or I did take away from that paper, is that things aren't stable. And you can wonder about why are they stable, but maybe because they can't be finding a Nash. Like, ad actions are not potential names, so if we don't know that learning converges to Nash, it probably does not. Um, so, in that particular context, we also know the names of the companies that some to help them, help them bid, and these are companies that advertise that they use machine learning techniques. Uh, but I think they don't mean our kind of learning, they mean gradient descent which is particular deterministic algorithm. Um, anyway, um, maybe spend a couple more minutes in sort of pros and cons, which actually we'll also spend on, on sort of extensions that you want, might want to do of no regret learning as an assumption. So something I already spent both of these points I've spent time on. It's a behavior, I like it as a behavioral assumption. It, is sim it doesn't say they should follow this algorithm. It kind of says if there is this really consistently good strategy X, please notice it somehow and adapt to it. We do have good algorithms that take care of it, but maybe most beautifully because it's a very clean behavior model, it's an inequality, <laughs> it's super usable, very similar to Nash, uh, to the Nash inequality, usable in theory. Uh, it does have some limitations, and this is sort of my biggest call of things I want to work on and things that um, maybe I want to use all of you to work on. So I guess the way I faced it here is maybe even a bigger error term than the usual one. I didn't make the error can be some epsilon times t, but whatever the error term is. Um, there are various theories of why you might not like this assumption. So um, there is the, it's too much to expect. So I said that there is learning algorithms here, but in order to run these learning algorithms, each of these learning algorithms has to list out the strategies you could do and then do something <laughs> with these strategies. This works wonderfully if you have two strategies. It works even well if, there, if you have n strategies and n is something decent. It even works if your strategies are passed in a graph which is exponentially many, but they're in a, in a smaller dimensional space, nicely. But it turns out, as by shown by this pair of papers, or sequence of papers, it doesn't work at all if you're, if you're bidding on multiple items. Now, what's wrong there? There are n items, and you can, you know, the continuum number of bids you might have. You might want to discretize it, and you discretize it to some, you know, k different bids and items, now it's k to the n. That's exponentially many. So there are too many bits to consider. And what they're showing is that it's hard. 
to do uh, to find that at, at Nash equilibrium or at this kind of <laughs> learning outcome or Nash equilibrium. So you can say that in some setup it's too much. You can't expect them to do well. And in fact, uh, I don't know if I have that. Uh, Daskalakis and, and uh, Oklastos and, and Vasily in the Fox paper also proposed something else. They said, oh, well, that's too hard, but here is something easier we can do. So you could, as a research direction here, in setups where learning is too hard to do, you know, okay, how bad can you learn? The spirit that if there is a good strategy, somehow notice it, um, might be still allowing you to do something, and that's what Kostas and, and Vasily do. They offer an alternate concept in the in the at the bidding of multiple items, which they can achieve. Um, there is also the criticism: it's a dumb thing to do. So this is from an EC18 paper of Beverman and Company, um, which actually won the EC Best Paper Award in that year. Um, and what they do is show to you that if the agent in a, again, multi multiple item auction uh, are running no regret learning, then you as an auctioner can extract all the profit from them. Every single bit of it. Much more than Myers on profit because the learning behavior is sort of very predictable and you can take care of learning the value and figuring out how much to put the reserve price at. Again, this paper too is trying to tell you that, okay, don't do the classical. So this is happening if they're running the, the algorithms I listed over there. Uh, sorry, back here. Oh, many slides back. I'm not going to go back there. But what the paper shows is that this happens if you're running any of the algorithms I listed over there from multiplicative bait to follow the perturb leader. They're offering an alternate algorithm that doesn't have this box. Uh, so you can ask, you know, if the, uh, if, the other, if the auctioner will take advantage of what you're doing, what is a good algorithm? And that's also part of what the paper does. Um, I want to also propose that, you know, okay, so this too says that these are bad things to do because it's too, too hard or because uh, um, they, you can take advantage of them. But you can also say you can expect more. You should, you should be able to do better than just doing no regret learning. And, there are many ways you can expect people to do better than this. Maybe the first one is, what do you mean single, single, uh, single strategy with hindsight? What, what learning is really good at is adjust to data. So if you want to run your ad like for a month, as it turns out, at the beginning of the month something was popular, but then something happened in the rest of the month something else is popular. This is literally what learning is for. It should be able to take care of this and learn to adjust. And this, at least for me personally, even the early days when I started to learn, work on learning in, in games, uh, the fact that learning can be better than Nash because it can adjust to change is a sentence I said with zero justification. Uh, it's just a story of why learning is better. But we can be sure that this is something I'm going to show you as a little technical part that one can try to take advantage. There are learning algorithms that do better. Uh, of course, you can expect them to always, every single iteration, do the very best that that single iteration has. That's too much to expect. But you can say that you should do well enough. If there is some strategy that's consistently good for a long enough period, please try to adjust to that one. Doesn't have to be the whole single strategy. So that's what shifting regret is. Shifting regret, your benchmark can change a couple of times as needed. Um, a different direction that would be nice to, to think about, but at the moment I don't have anything really positive to offer. Um, you know, don't opponents, don't people do better when they do learning in games than finding an ash? And I guess. The first paper that convinced me to start thinking about, and again, unfortunately, at the moment, not very successfully, is this Defarius Megiddo paper, which appeared in NIPS 03, so at this point, it's pretty odd. And what they tried to think about is learning two, pe two people, learning a learning strategy, uh, but the, what the game they're playing is prisoner dilemma. Um, repeated prisoner dilemma. So what does learning do? What does our classical learning algorithms do in a prisoner dilemma? 
I presume most of you know this. How many people know what happens if you run learning in a prison or drama? Oh, not that many. Okay, then let me do this slower, even though I don't have slides to do it slower. Prisoner Dilemma. So what's Prisoner Dilemma? Prisoner Dilemma is a game that uh, two strategies, um, you know, you code for a crime and, or two of you both code for a crime that you committed. Uh, the police has some minor offense on you that you also parked illegally and they can put you in jail for two days if, you know, but they really want to put you away for long term because they want to commit you for a crime. They put you in separate rooms, they interrogate you. Your two strategies is to tell on your other guy, in which case they give you, you know, a discount on your penalty if you cooperate versus not. If neither of you cooperate, you both spend two days in jail because you both part illegally. However, if you cooperate and the opposite other guy doesn't, you don't have to spend your two days in jail. Unfortunately, if you both do this, then you get both committed for the real crime, get two days off for good behavior. So instead of spending two years in prison, you spend two days, two years minus two days. The unique dominant strategy solution here, as we all know, is to tell on the other guy. Because no matter what, you're two days better off if you told on the other guy. Now, what does that mean for learning? The unique no regret strategy is to tell on the other guy. Because no matter what the other guy did, if you historically think how bad, how well you would be off, given that, you know, you know, affecting his behavior, you're literally always two days better off if you tell on the other guy. So the unique strategy that any of these learning algorithms can learn to do is to defect and tell on the other guy. That's the only thing that can happen. And it's not because of, this time it's not because of the name of the algorithm. It's not because you ran multiplicative weights. It's because it has the no regret property. There's only one strategy that can have the no regret property, and that is to tell on the other guy. In a repeated prisoner drama, that's clearly the wrong thing to do. Okay, good strategies here are things like tit for tat and stuff like that that try to induce the other guy to cooperate with you because if he doesn't, I'm going to punish you. But you know, if you cooperate, I'll be good to you also. So I guess what um, the Farias and Megiddo is doing is, or, is offering a learning algorithm that learns to cooperate. So they take into effect is that the opponent, you might want to induce your opponent to cooperate in a learning algorithm, and that learning no regret is the wrong standard here. You want to learn to learn to play the strategy that induces the other guy to do his best. And that's the that Farias Makito paper, and then the more recent Aurora Deccan and Tavari paper from ICML 12 is actually giving this kind of a name. It gets policy regret, that is you trying to learn the best policy, where you not have regret for a policy, what would be your regret? Had I played this policy all the time, then maybe I would have induced the opponent to, to cooperate with me and do better. And I guess one sort of big direction that would be nice to get somewhere on is that maybe if it's, if it's this sort of better form of learning, maybe we can do better things, like in, in places where cooperation would be good for us. Definitely two player prisoner dilemma is one of them, and that's the, Far the, Far the Farias Megiddo paper, but maybe there are many other applications where cooperation is good, and this form of learning would induce something better. Uh, I could have actually gone further, and that's my next bullet here, I could have gone to the equilibrium of the repeated game, and so far I'm trying to stay away from this in part uh, because those things tend to be too complicated and sort of price and energy will be really bad, all kinds of weird things are also Nash equilibrium. Um, also, because I like this sort of learning as a behavioral model and that's not what that does. Again, it has the knowledge problem that Nash, Nash usually has. Um, sort of supporting learning or, not, or, or knowing that learning is a game, maybe I do one more discussion of there is a bunch of sort of empirical papers um, talking about um, whether something does or doesn't satisfy in order to get learning. Uh, interestingly, if I list these papers, um, oh, I guess I 
list this paper. So the paper I showed you the data from was this um, Dennis Setanis and me and Vasily and me uh, from the adduction King data. Uh, these papers vary whether the conclusion is that people are learning or may not learning. Uh, and I want to claim that my conclusion for every single one of them is that they are learning, despite that some of them conclude that they're not learning. Maybe most interesting negative point is the uh, Nissan and Naughty paper, which is expre explicitly trying to compare themselves to the uh, paper, our paper above it, to say that they actually run a human subject lab experiment to figure out if in an ad auction game that the human subjects, that is uh, Hebrew University students, had to run. Uh, do they actually learn to do the right behavior? And they say, no, look, they're not learning. So why is this nice? Because in a true adoption paper, uh, we don't actually know what people's values are because those are advertisers, and I don't know if they know it, but it's hard to, you know, we can try to ask them, but uh, it's hard to know. Uh, without asking them, whereas this are not is a human subject experiment, they taught the people what the value is. So the question is, do they can they re-infer the value from the from their behavior, or given that they know the value, is their behavior consistent with this uh, having the Lord get property? And what they conclude is that if your value is reasonably high, then you pretty much satisfy the property. If your value is very low, sometimes so low that your rational behavior should have been to go home. And in the environment where they played it, that is, they, these kids were committed to playing the game for half an hour to get paid, uh, you're supposed to sit there and not touch your keyboard. Uh, that would have been the optimal behavior. And apparently, people really did badly on that regime. They kept playing. So kept playing to the level that they take home. So the way they got paid is some base amount of pay for showing up, and then plus what they made. And these people ended up <coughs> below the base amount. So they made a negative amount of money while they were playing. But somehow sitting there for half an hour and not touching the keyboard is an unbelievably frustrating activity. And I see how I wouldn't be good at that as a human. Whereas if I'm actually in the real business, I might just quit. There are other things I can do. I don't have to participate. So the fact that those low value people didn't set aside the property, that doesn't bother me so much. That, that might not be happening in real life experiments. Uh, I'm going to skip this and maybe go back and spend some minutes, a uh, little bit at the end on the, the one result of ours that I wanted to talk about. So what we already have seen so far is the Nash equilibrium, which I'm not using the uh, proper acronym according to Christos because an F is missing on my price of energy slide. This extension, which I already spent some time talking about for learning outcomes if they're uh, no regret learners. And then one limitation of this extension is that the assumption here in these papers is that um, they repeatedly playing the very same game. And here is one extension along the lines of the, that we hope to expect from people a little bit more. Uh, repeated game is a dynamic population. So what I mean here is I'm going to dynamically exchange the players, like have the players quit and new players show up. If I do that, then I have to change my notation to somehow include who the players are. So instead of just saying the cost of the strategy and cost of the strategy is compared to t times the optimum because it's the same optimum, now optimum will change too, depends who the players are, and I have to put that into the notation. So this is a, a same benchmark as the price of energy, except now the players change over time. So because the players are changing, say, yours keep playing, but some other guys went home and new people came, you might need to adjust your strategy to this. So this is coming from a paper of um, Vasily Sirkanis and, and, and Todoris Likaris. Um, and that technically the model is that they're uh, an end player, end population game. We can do this both for auction games and routing games. Um, and with some probability P, the players get replaced in, with new players. So, if you can make this probability high enough, then, or whatever you make it with n players, then n times p players change all the time. So there is always change going on, this constant churn. And I guess our claim is that um, people will be able to adjust to this change 
as long as uh, I keep the probability of change roughly logarithmic, or one over logarithmic in the size of the game, that is the number of nodes in the game, or number of items on sale, or something of that sort. So uh, the, play, the number of players doesn't matter. There could be many players changing. What matters is how big is the game. Why does that matter? Because that matters how fast you can learn, how many different strategies are that you can learn, learn, learn from. Um, so two things we're changing on no regret learning, and this is the part I want to more emphasize than the details of the proofs. Uh, which I also will at least have a couple of slides on. One thing I want to change in part motivated that it works better, and in part motivated because the data more showed that that was true. I want to switch to what, at least in this NIPS paper we have, we call approximate no regret. That has given you an approximation error and say if you're within 5%, you're off. I don't know if people really optimizing below this some small constant percent error. If I look at the Microsoft data, when I said they satisfied the lower net property, I meant that they're using 5% of the error, that this error is less than 5%, and I was happy there. I don't know if they go down below this. Uh, if you started doing lower net learning, when it started, this multiplicative weights, usually the first algorithm you learn is this. And then you learn that if you properly set your epsilon, you can make it magically go to, go to zero as time goes to infinity. In the bands, we're actually using this particular form and giving you an epsilon error. In my agenda of pri proving no price of energy bands, I think this is the right thing to work with. Uh, for two reasons. One, price of energy is usually you know, a 2 or a 1.5 for some constant. Plus, epsilon is noise. If you cared about a band of two, then two plus epsilon will be just as good for you. Uh, and that allowed me to make the regret error go to something much smaller. There is no T in it. So a regret error is that epsilon version, the regret error can be much more limited, which will allow people to learn faster because the error goes, goes to zero faster. Um, I'm using Tim's smoothness framework, and at least the way this talk is imagined, I imagine all of you, or almost all of you, are very familiar with this, uh, which is in part why I didn't want to spend so much time on. Uh, but even if and some of you are not, the sort of the main message of the smoothness framework is that what we want out of the players is something very, very simple, much simpler than a Nash equilibrium. Um, in the game, we have an optimal strategy, which I call it AI star. That's what they should do if I want to achieve the socially optimum outcome. This may or may not be good for them to do selfishly, but this is what the social optimum is. And the single thing I want out of them is I want them not to regret not having done that. So there is a single strategy, which they're not aware of which one it is, because they don't even know who the other players are, and I just want them not to regret that strategy. And we're using no regret learning because, as I just pointed out, they don't know what, which, which their strategy is. The no regret learning makes them not regret any one of them, in particular this one. And that's what the proofs are, and the, that's the smoothness condition, and you simply can put it together, and I won't even go through the slides to say that if they're not regretting what the optimum would have done, or what this particular strategy would have done, then, then um, we can prove these smoothness bands. Um, this was ideal for learning because learning actually is set up to do this. Um, that is not regret any particular fixed strategy with hindsight. But in my agenda, or the current small this agenda of changing players, this is exactly what's problematic. So um, if it's this single strategy with hindsight, use this, which maybe should have been read here, the optimal strategy with hindsight. But if the players are changing, then there isn't an optimal strategy with hindsight. As the players play, there are different optimal strategies. So, you know, you can easily imagine, say, this in a traffic writing context, that people show up and, you know, this that guy shows up, and when he shows up, the upper pass is very occupied, and everyone's driving there, he knows to choose the lower pass. But as time goes on, those guys vanish, and some other guys show up, and you're in bad luck, and you go on have to change your strategy. And as I said in the beginning, uh, many of us, definitely including me, have been advertising from literally from day one that this is what learning is for. Learners can adjust to this. They can learn to adjust this. So I'm going to have to use a little bit stronger 
learning condition, and I guess the version we're using again using the epsilons, that is the uh, giving you a fixed, say, 5% error band, is that uh, very simple learning, simple to adjust all of these learning algorithms to satisfy this, this slightly stronger strategy uh, condition, which is compared to a changing benchmark, instead of a single x, an xt, as long as that x doesn't change too often. So what we're giving here as a bond is that if the x changes at most k times, then your error it goes up by a factor of k. And I think this is roughly, this is what you should expect, or at least without knowing k, this is the best you can expect with something like this. Um, you know, even if I told you that, hey, guy, this is the moment your optimum change, please restart your learning, then this is what you would get. What's nice here is you can get this without warning for them that it's time to change the learning. This somehow happens automatically. How do they achieve this? Um, you know, the simplest way to achieve this, and this is actually maybe going back to some of the experimental studies, to inject a bit of recency bias in their behavior. So again, assuming most of you or all of you know what learning algorithms do, what learning algorithms do is keep historical data on how certain strategies would have been good for you in the past. And what the suggestion is, yeah, yeah, good idea. But every now and then wipe out your memory, because things that happened centuries back is probably not so relevant. Remember, we are in dynamic games, the people are changing. So those ancient people that were around when you started, they're probably not here anymore, or who knows, maybe that's not happening. So please only keep a limited amount of memory, don't keep the end, or discount the past, or something. And inject a form of recency bias to help yourself value the current experience more than the recent experience. And one of the experimental studies in the beginning that I didn't explicitly or spend too much time on talking about also was a human subject experiment that we were complaining that humans are too recency biased. And again, my reaction is, yeah, there is a good reason we are recency biased. We learned that you know recent things are more relevant, like things that happened yesterday. Life is probably just like that. So I guess this is a recency biased form of learning that we are using. Um, now, I claim that in most games, or almost all games I know of, this is going to be good enough. So even with the changing population, even uh, if they're doing this little bit better form of learning, then they should be able to adjust. And maybe this comes the one small technical part of what I want to show you. So if I take the framework, smoothness framework that Tim uh, suggested, uh, and want to directly apply it, it doesn't seem to want to apply, at least not up front, needs a little bit of adjustment. So what do I want to do? What I wanted to do is wanted to say that what they're doing, so the AP strategies that they were all choosing, should um, not be worse or not be much worse than the optimum strategy. But the optimum, optimum is a super sensitive object. So even if one person of this room be running some sort of matching game and you find the optimal matching and then, you know, George just walks out the room. The optimal matching is a changes on a ginormous augmenting pass. Who knows? There could be arbitrary amount of changes. So the optimum is a super sensitive object. And I guess matching is what I have here on the slide to convince you of. If you take the optimum matching, one person leaves, you take a giant augmenting pass, and then you know the number of people who change could be as many as the number of items. It's a long augmenting pass. So comparing to the optimum is maybe a bit too much. Uh, and I guess what we're doing in this paper is proposing that in almost all these games, and many of the games we go through in the paper from auctions to writing, you can give, you can, we can give you an approximate optimum, often losing only an epsilon and sometimes losing effect, an additional factor of two in the quality, is the property that that optimum is very insensitive. Why is it is so? This is this A tilde star that is a, a solution that's very close to the optimum uh, but is not sensitive to changes. Now, 
We're actually giving you algorithms to achieve this Euler star. It's nice to point out that I don't need the algorithm. I just need it to exist. Because once it exists, then the learners will learn to not regret it. Um, and then give you a price of energy. What we're actually uh, achieving is, I guess, a multiplication of three factors, two of which you're very familiar with. In the third, maybe I spent one more minute at the end on. So the three factors of we lose as a price of bound is one, the alpha, the classical price of energy bound. So whatever you can prove about the price of energy, we're not going to get better. Uh, while I do believe in the agenda that George and I started not 10 years ago, the learning can do better than Nash, not in this way. Not in this way. You have to be off of a random start. If I start them off a Nash, they're going to be stuck there. So that this way, we definitely have to lose the factor off of there, the, the price of energy bond. There's a little bit of extra loss with the, with the regret error. Uh, if I drive the price of change, uh, the probability of change to zero, of course, they will have longer time to learn, and therefore regret error will go to zero. If I keep them, if they have to change a lot, then regret error, remember it had the K in it, so regret error will be something. And then the last part is B dot that I want to spend a few more minutes on, is that I need a benchmark that they can learn against that's close to the optimum but very non-changing. And we're offering two um, solutions for this. One is a sort of um, a applicable in a few instances, and it's a simpler solution. Whenever a greedy algorithm is approximately optimal, such as on metrics, Greedy is a factor of two from the optimum. Greedy is a lot less sensitive to changes than the true optimum. And I guess you have to do a couple adjustments to greedy. Uh, I have to run a, you know, a, a approximation greedy, and which then creates ties. And then I have to resolve the ties favoring the previous solution, uh, which makes it less sensitive. Um, and then maybe as a bigger hammer that one can employ here, there is a whole area that have been trying to get solutions for us that are not sensitive to change. And the name for that area is called differential privacy. Uh, what those guys want to do is they want to give you a solution uh, that not sensitive to one person's input because of privacy reasons. I want to not sensitive to one person's input because he might go home. But it's the same goal. I want to not be sensitive to this. So if I take the differentially private algorithms that they prove that close to optimum, that serves as a perfect benchmark in our case. Um, we have to do some adjustment because they had some failure probabilities, but minor detail. So I'm going to end with a couple of sort of messages and conclusions. So I still like learning as a good way to play. And there are many unfinished agendas in this, in this setup um, that I'm somewhat actively working on, and I would love to induce as many of you as possible to also work on. Uh, one of them is, you know, advantage of learning compared to regular NASH is no need for common priors, so I don't have to know who else is playing. But one other advantage of learning is that if the, child, if the opponent is playing badly, I should be able to take advantage of him or her, right? If, you know, just because we're playing rock, paper, scissor with a zero expected outcome, if the opponents play badly, I can do more. And if you don't know that this is the case, then there is a really beautiful app out there uh, advertised by the New York Times at some point that's insanely good at beating us uh, on rock, paper, scissor. That is apparently we all play badly. Uh, if you haven't tried it, it's fascinating. And I know I can't beat it. I mean, I can't come out zero. I lose uh, a lot. lot. Uh, I don't have an interesting, I like have proposals of how to set up a framework where you can somehow prove interesting things about this, that learning is good at taking advantage of the opponent, but I don't have something to show you. Um, but I showed you, what, what we did show here is that in, even in dynamic population, uh, it can do well um, despite turnover, and there are some open questions that I definitely left in the big open questions, there are many more than this. Can we do better than, can, can we do better than the worst case Nash? That the, what are the class of games where we can hope to do better? I think my favorite and most clearly open problem here is uh, the opposite, the cost sharing form of congestion games. That's a class of congestion games where the price of energy is horrendous. 
but the price of stability is really good. There's a ginormous gap. And the question is, which Nash are they converging to? Hopefully the better one. Um, can other form of learning do better? Is it helpful to do, say, the Megiddo, the Faria style policy learning, or the Faria's Megiddo style policy learning? Um, and then maybe sort of the biggest, um, biggest secret or, or cheat that we have been doing all along is this additive values over time. So uh, it somehow assumes not only that the values are additive, but they're running separate instances of the game at different iterations. Uh, this is certainly uh, an agenda that I know many, many different groups, especially working for tech companies, are working on. In the ad action business, there is a definitely big item that they know to know to uh, that ties people over is named the budget. And while in the data I showed, I especially chose advertisers with insanely high budgets. Apparently, those guys are in a minority, and most of them have budgets that are binding, which means that the different businesses are not separate; they, they're sharing the same budget. Um, in the packet routing, there is also it, it's an excellent model of morning rush hour traffic, no matter how bad Monday morning was, by Tuesday morning those guys are crap. So if you get a new instance, uh, that's not true in many other sessions. And I'm going to thank you for your attention and thanks. All right, so we started a bit late, so I guess we still have time for a couple of questions, if there are any. advantage of the behavior. Now if they uh, play against each other, you think that you're going to get back to the complicated uh, equilibrium of the repeated game? Um, so that's certainly a good question. I said that I was trying to stay away from Nash equilibrium of the repeated game because that's too complicated and yet I allowed some complication <coughs> of you know them playing games that try to induce the opponent to to uh, react. Yes, on the, at the utmost level, yes, they would. But it's sort of depending. What, like I, I think one can try to control this uh, with you know playing strategies that can induce k changes with a fixed k, and then see how things depend on k. The same way, I think as um, you know, learning to do well against an arbitrary changing optimum is not helpful. But it turned out that if I limit the changes to k, then very simple adjustment to the learning algorithm will take care of it. So I'm hoping that this way of thinking about it allows me to put in, a, put in parameters that control the complication. And then hopefully we can do well with, with the limited complication. That's certainly what the, the Farias Magito algorithm is doing. So it, it says that you know if the opponent will not react to you, uh, only, you know, if the opponent will only react to you after long sequences, that's going to be hard to learn from. But if the opponent is sufficiently reactive, then you can achieve something. So I guess they're, they're one step in that direction already. Of, you know, they're hoping that, you know, if the opponent is such that seven corporations in a row will use him to cooperate, I get their algorithm will learn to do this. Any more questions? 